All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank everyone um, who is joining us today um, for the webinar, Immutable Infrastructure in the Age of Kubernetes. I'm Taylor Wagner, the Operations Analyst here at CNCF, and I will be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenter today, Tim Gurla, the CEO of Telos Systems. A, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, during the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee, um, but there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A and we'll get back to you as soon as we can towards the end of the webinar. Um, a reminder that we want to use the Q&A box and not the chat window. So um, please direct all questions to Q&A. This is an official webinar of the CNCF um, and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. So please do not add anything to the chat or to the questions that would be in violation of the code of conduct. So please basically just be respectful of all of your fellow participants and our presenter today. And one last thing, the recording and slides will be posted on the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars later today. With that, I'll hand it over to Timothy to kick off today's presentation. Thanks, Taylor. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for joining everybody. Uh, my name is Tim and I'm going to be talking a little bit about immutable infrastructure uh, in Kubernetes, a little bit of the history of what immutable infrastructure is and how it's kind of evolved from the uh, from the early days. So first of all, uh, a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Tim. Uh, I've been working in infrastructure software for you know, most of my career, I spent some time at a, at a company early on called RPath, and we were doing some interesting things around uh, kind of automatically generating system images based on applications and their dependencies. Um, and I think that some of that work kind of, you know, paved the way for, for my interest in, uh, in customized Linux operating systems, uh, containers and virtualization, obviously. Um, I spent some time at a company called Eucalyptus, we were building an on-premise implementation of Amazon's web services. I'm sure some of you remember Eucalyptus and uh, probably kind of OpenStack, the, the spiritual successor, so to speak, of Eucalyptus. Um, from there, I went to Ansible. I was one of the co-founders uh, there at Ansible, and um, we, uh, we ended up selling the company to, to Red Hat. And from there, I uh, co-founded a, a company called Talos, and I'll talk a little bit more, little bit more about Talos uh, later on down in the slides. Uh, I live in North Carolina um, with my two dogs and my wife and a bunch of trees in the backyard. So that's me. Um, so enough about me, let's talk about immutable infrastructure. Um, first of all, you know, what is it? Uh, let's, let's take a step back and start with some of the traditional methods of systems management from the 1990s, maybe the early 2000s, and and you know what systems management would look like back then, it, at least in my experience, that there were some exceptions, I'm sure, but the general rule was, you had your uh, your identically configured systems uh, running in a data center, sitting in a rack. You had your web servers, your app servers, your load balancers, etc., and these probably would have been configured by hand. Uh, logging in, a sysadmin would log in, run commands, update packages. Um, maintain these machines manually, kind of on a per machine basis. Um, operators would uh, apply security fixes, change configuration, and do what they could to keep these systems consistent across the fleet. Uh, over time though, this, this manual approach um, usually led to divergence between systems. So you'd end up with, you know, slightly different packages on, on, different, uh, on different systems. Uh, you'd end up with, with slight configuration differences between systems. Um, and this, you know, the, the operators of these machines, they're, they're well-meaning, uh, working to solve problems on a case-by-case on a -case basis, you know, fixing each system as necessary to keep it running. And uh, if, you know, if you're old enough like me, I'm sure that you probably remember operating some of these machines this way. And so the, the end result of this kind of process was a, a series of uh, so-called snowflakes. These are, you know, artisanally handcrafted systems that were, that were built over time to solve a particular problem. And they were difficult to uh, replicate if something happened, if the disk crashed, or if um, if you know an operator moved to a different company, it, it was sometimes rather difficult to get back to a known state and get back to a situation where you felt like you could repeatedly uh, recreate whatever system you you had in your data center. So 
what did that do? That gave you a, a fairly brittle infrastructure. Uh, if something if something changed, if a system went down, if a disk crashed, if an operator left, you didn't really have a path forward to get get to a known good state. Um, so back to a uh, back to immutable infrastructure. Uh, what does that exactly mean? Um, my definition is, you know, it's a it's a system that does not change once it's been deployed. Uh, if you need to patch it, if you need to upgrade it, if you need to change its its on disk configuration, you'd shut it down and uh, and you'd launch a new one. So you wouldn't make in you you wouldn't make uh, you wouldn't make changes to that system midstream. You wouldn't apply security patches on a, on a per package or a per file or a per application basis. Instead, you take, you, t you shut it all the way down, you throw it away and you start, you start up a new one. Um, what's, uh, what's the benefit of this model, right? So I've identified a few here. Uh, there's probably others. Um, what it does is it makes a lot of things related to the deployment and management of the system easier. If you're dealing with immutable infrastructure, you can basically eliminate configuration drift. Uh, if nobody is modifying these systems as they're running in place, you have a much greater assurance that the system as it was deployed is the one that's currently running. Uh, along with that, you gain improved consistency between your development stages. So, you know, if you, if you have uh, kind of a strict workflow and a strict process, each step along the way, whether it's your developer on the desktop or laptop, uh, into, into QA, into production, uh, ideally you'll be dealing with the exact same system image with the exact same bits and, you know, within reason, the same configuration. <clears throat> um, what you also get from an immutable system deployment methodology is, is much easier access to uh, more sophisticated mechanisms like uh, rollbacks, uh, A-B testing of environments. Um, it makes staging upgrades easier if, if you're, if instead of modifying a system in place, you're just throwing something away. Um, you do need a lot of infrastructure for this to happen. Uh, this wasn't really possible back in the, in the 90s and 2000s before, uh, you know, before virtualization kind of came onto the scene and gave you a lot more agility and flexibility around how you deploy systems, how you throw away systems, and how you launch new ones. Um, but of course, nothing is free. Uh, immutable systems do have their downsides. And in the early days of, of immutable infrastructure and immutable systems, there were some problems with the approach, some, some issues and some, some things that were difficult. Uh, primarily maintaining that golden image was, was a bit of a chore. Uh, you usually had to be dealing with an entire operating system and you had, you know, maybe some rudimentary tools to, to make that happen. Um, the tools that we were building at our path were, were intending to, to solve some of these problems. But what you ended up with is a, a system where the OS and the application were fairly coupled. They were tightly coupled. They were inextricably linked. If you're deploying these to a virtualization platform, as opposed to a container platform, your application images had to basically contain the entire operating system and, and everything else involved. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about the history of immutable environments and immutable systems. Um, so the, the first sort of the, the, the first hint of immutable systems in, in my mind came from Red Hat about 13 years ago in, in 2006. Uh, Red Hat slash Fedora announced a project called Stateless Linux and Stateless Linux was intended to solve the, the so-called snowflake problem by using an immutable uh, read-only file system for, it, for the root partition of each class of machines, right? So by each class, I mean web servers, database servers, app servers, et cetera. Um, when and, and Red Hat developed a whole methodology and, and some uh, some some and put some engineering work into making this happen. Uh, when you needed to make a change to the system's configuration or upgrade a package, that change would be applied to the golden image, and it would be rolled out uh, via you know different mechanisms to the appropriate machines. Um, this ended up eliminating the snowflake problem. And it ensured that the configuration and versions of the underlying software uh, did not diverge between systems, between deployments, uh, between dev, test, and production, etc. So for various reasons, and I'm not sure of, of all of the reasons, uh, stateless, Linux, stateless Linux's specific implementation of immutable infrastructure didn't really catch on. Um, instead, I think that the industry kind of moved more towards tools like uh, Puppet, Chef, and Ansible, um, things that 
allowed you to automate the process of logging in and applying security updates and making configuration changes in a, in a declarative way or you know even in, a, in an imperative way uh, so you ended up with the same result you had a, a common state deployed across your your infrastructure uh, your configuration was consistent across your fleet of systems um, using a different technique using uh, you know playbooks and and manifests and so on to describe the state of your system and then there was a tool that went out there and and made it so um, and you know the, the benefits of either platform here are are pretty clear uh, you can you can eliminate that configuration drift um, <clears throat> you end up with similar more similarities between test and dev and and so on so kind of a uh, I, I like to look at the, the Puppet Chef and Ansible style tools as kind of a, a diversion um, that, that the industry took on the way to getting to real immutable infrastructure. Um, when Amazon uh, rolled out their EC2 Elastic Compute Platform and as virtualization kind of um, gained favor and, and gained performance and, and began to be deployed in, in, in people's infrastructure, uh, the those advances kind of made the idea of a stateless system more approachable and um, I think that Netflix really kind of helped uh, popularize this approach as they really went all in on, on the Amazon cloud platform uh, they popularized the concept of the blue green deployment where you know this methodology involves uh, deploying an entirely new group of servers which in in a pre-cloud environment would be very difficult and very expensive. You basically have to double your, your data center. But since you're paying by the hour, paying by the machine in the, in the, in the cloud, um, <clears throat> you could do that and you could, you could stand up this entirely new group of uh, green servers. And instead of logging into the live, the blue servers and updating them, you'd stand up your green system, you'd test your green system, you'd make sure it's good to go. And then you'd flip your load balancer over to talk to the new servers. Um, this means that you could do a lot of uh, a lot of upfront testing and validation against the the green stack without impacting users. And then once that testing and validation passed, the traffic would be shifted to the to the green stack, and the blue stack would be decommissioned. Um, so you know, using these tools, using these concepts, uh, a series of golden images that that represents your applications and and your components, I, Netflix and and others got. Uh, quite a bit closer to the goal of having these systems be fully immutable and 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 see all the benefits the, uh, provided by that there still were some downsides as as I mentioned in a previous slide uh, you know building the golden images was a difficult process uh, depending on the particular cloud you were working on the process for getting those new images the, those those AMIs up to the up to the cloud platform involved quite a bit of work <clears throat> Uh, it was slow. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're pushing hundreds of uh, hundreds of megabytes or maybe gigabytes um, up to the cloud over over your over your 2007 internet connection, etc. Um, the other thing that that you kind of had in this situation was that the the application and the operating system were still tightly linked. You couldn't really separate those two parts if you needed to move one piece forward or or, or keep one piece back. You had to worry about the dependency. Uh, the dependency closures and, and so on. So there were still some challenges. A, a big organization with a lot of resources like Netflix could certainly uh, take advantage of these concepts, but it might have been more challenging for a smaller organization with less resources to really see those kind of benefits. Um, moving ahead, kind of in in the uh, in in the in the timeline. Um, after Amazon EC2 came out and, and some of these new concepts were, were being deployed, uh, tools like Packer from HashiCorp came on the scene and uh, Docker as well. So both of these systems had ways to generate, uh, generate these golden images based on a, descript, a, a, a descriptor. Uh, in the Docker case, of course, it'd be a Docker file. Uh, Packer had a similar mechanism to assemble these systems and, and, and output them in a certain format. So, that, so we started to see some tooling emerge um, that made that image build process a, a little bit less troublesome. Uh, we had improvements in the way that these, the, the improvements in the cloud APIs to receive these new images, and it became easier to iterate, easier to update. Uh, it became easier to, to track changes and update existing platforms. Um, all of this is kind of at the beginning of, of, of containers taking over the industry a little bit. 
And you still had some challenges in terms of, you know, how do you run these containers? Who is responsible for making sure that the, that the right containers are running at the right time? Um, where are they running in your infrastructure? What happens if they go away? What happens if a, if a node crashes? What happens if you lose access to, to one of your systems? Um, and, and I think, you know, from that problem, that's where Kubernetes comes in. And that's where Kubernetes uh, began as this container orchestration platform to solve some of these problems to, to again, kind of shift the burden away from the away from the manual step-by-step -step process to, to handle some of this stuff and move it more to a declarative, more to a, you know, desired state configuration. <clears throat> um, so Kubernetes really, uh, really made this, the container workflow possible. Um, it, it, uh, it, it began to decouple the operating system from the applications. Uh, containers allowed you to really uh, pare down what goes into your systems and, and decouple the, the application components from the operating system components. Uh, it took the burden off of the administrator to decide uh, where and how these application containers could run. Um, things like storage abstractions and network abstractions made it easier to begin to separate the ephemeral storage that you might need for, you know, uh, uh, local state uh, for, for a particular application and persistent storage, which is, you know, of course, the, the storage that, that holds your application data and your user data and, and database uh, storage and so on. So going back to the, the, going back to the Ansible Puppet and Chef style tools, as, as containers uh, and Kubernetes and, and Docker files and so on, as, as these things uh, gained prominence in the industry, I think that those, the, the imperative and declarative configuration management tools like Ansible, Puppet, Chef, and so on, I think they become less important uh, because you're doing less work on the live running systems and you're doing, you're, you're, you're kind of pushing the you're pushing the change or er, changes earlier and earlier in the development cycle. So more of the more of that change and more of that image churn, those cycles, updates, and so on, are happening earlier in the uh, in the development cycle. Um, and of course, that also began to to uh, continue this decoupling of of, of app and OS. <laughs> um, so I kind of you know talking about today, we've got. Uh, We've got Kubernetes, we've got uh, container image build tools, we've got a lot of interesting uh, componentry out there at the, at the application layer. And, and I'm sure a lot of you, if you're using Kubernetes, if you're deploying your applications on Kubernetes, you've, you've seen and taken advantage of, of some of the concepts of immutable systems um, for your applications. And, and hopefully you've seen some, some advantages in terms of agility and, and you know, time to deploy and, and, and uh, uptime and so forth. Uh, what I think hasn't happened very much are, are changes at the host level, right? So the, the, the machines that run Kubernetes, the machines that run your container orchestration tools, um, what if you could apply those same immutable, immutability concepts to your Kubernetes host environment? And, uh, and I think you would begin to see some of those same advantages. You would see more stability, you'd see less sort of, you know, handcrafted, hand configured systems. Um, and you'd be able to upgrade faster. You'd be able to roll back if you needed to. Um, so a lot of this stuff in terms of running, running your Kubernetes infrastructure entirely uh, in an immutable way, that's been one of the design goals for Talos, the company that I'm involved with. Um, it's, a, it's a new operating system designed specifically to host Kubernetes clusters and, and to be a container host. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Talos and then I'll talk about kind of how how these concepts of immutability apply to your Kubernetes environment. Um, so one of the design goals of, of Talos has, uh, has certainly been um, to be immutable and for these systems to be immutable and ephemeral, meaning you don't change them once they're launched and you can throw them away at any time. Um, so Talos is an open source operating system uh, based on Linux. We've been in development for just about three years. And uh, last year we, we launched a company to, to fund its development and to build out uh, a services and support organization around this new method of, of hosting Kubernetes. Um, Talos is, is very, you know, highly inspired by CoreOS and a couple of, uh, couple of other platforms that have come before. 
Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about the architecture of Talos. Uh, again, it's an open source OS based on Linux. You can see that the Linux kernel is, is at the base of, of each of these components. And the goal has really been to um, build an operating system that makes sense in a, in a modern distributed environment. So we've made a number of design decisions in that direction. And, and some of them, I feel like, uh, I've, some of them are a little bit radical, right? So we have actually uh, removed console access. There's no SSH, there's no shell in the system. Instead, everything is, is managed via an API. So uh, as you can see in the diagram, we've got uh, the, the OS CTL, uh, command line tool, which communicates with the API. Um, you can also communicate with it directly, directly with the API. And, and we've tried to, you know, build a, a solid and, and modern API to do these OS management tasks that, that you need to do. Um, a little bit more about Talos's architecture. Uh, just like Kubernetes, we've got it split up into control planes and, and, and workers. So, so uh, Linux, Talos, and the, the kubelet run on, on all of those. Um, the the system uh, the, the system has been designed from the beginning to be immutable. So we we actually launch in, into a, a squash FS root file system. It runs out of RAM and it never touches disk. Uh, Kubernetes does need some ephemeral storage, so so we do have a provision for that. Uh, but what this means is that even a, a dedicated attacker, uh, from a security perspective, even a dedicated attacker who who manages to access the system. Uh, they can't change that root file system. They can't, they can't log in, they can't remount it with right access, et cetera. Uh, along with this, the fact that there's no shell, no SSH server, no other way to, to obtain console access to these Talos hosts means that the system is very difficult to modify while running. Uh, I would imagine that if you have um, access to the data center itself. If you could roll a crash card up to these systems, I'm sure you could find a way. But uh, we think that you know we've added a few layers of, of safety and security there from a uh, from an OS perspective. Um, so you know the the immutability of the system gives you some security benefits, and as we talked about earlier, you also get the benefits that uh, you know that the configuration is what you is what you tested with you know that there is going to be no unexpected changes from you know either well-intended operators who might make a mistake or might uh, might make a change and not tell the rest of the team you're also uh, more secure against uh, you know nefarious intruders who might exploit uh, a security problem in in various uh, in various ways um, so I could talk more about uh, I'd talk more about Talos and, and I'm happy to answer questions there. I'll, I'll leave some of that for the, the Q&A afterwards. But I did want to kind of walk through, uh, walk through the, the upgrade process, kind of an illustration of, of one of the, one of the workflows, one of the important workflows related to an immutable system. How do you update it? How do you upgrade it? How do you, how do you, how do you change it when it does need to be changed? And you know, so this is just one example. This this is a workflow that we have implemented as a as a as a Kubernetes controller, as a, as an operator underneath the hood. Uh, so so this is automated. Um, I think you could probably take a similar approach to handle your applications. Uh, there's a lot of good examples out there on the internet. But let me just walk through this uh, walk through this little workflow here, and talk about what it takes for Talos to upgrade a node. Um, it's uh, again, it's similar to how you'd upgrade your applications, but this is for the host environment that's running Kubernetes. Uh, this process is the same no matter where you're running Talos and Kubernetes, whether you're on cloud, virtualization, bare metal, uh, it's all handled automatically by our upgrade controller. Um, and it starts with someone, someone or something making an API request to perform the upgrade. So that API call comes in, uh, we, we cordon and we drain the node of, of requests. Um, if you're familiar with, you know, load balancers and, 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 how, and how, those, how that flow works, this should be familiar. We stop any new requests coming in. We do what we can to get rid of any existing requests, wait for them to finish. Um, once that's done, once, we are, once we're cordoned and drained, uh, we'll stop the kubelet and remove all the pods on that system. Uh, we'll verify the upgrade path. Uh, we'll do some work within etc etcd to to make sure that all the members are, are are set up and started appropriately. And then for this particular node that we're upgrading, we'll unmount the ephemeral disk. We'll reset the partition table and run the installer. 
Um, in, in the Talos example, the install is pretty quick. It's a, it's a fairly simple, uh, simple setup. Um, I don't have a lot of technical detail in here, but if, if you'd like to know more, feel free to join us, uh, you know, in Slack afterwards, or, you know, you could throw a question into the Q and A and I'll do my best to answer. Uh, once the install is complete, we <clears throat> will reboot the node and we'll verify its health. Uh, we'll uncoordinate and we will uh, bring that machine back up and it's, it's hopefully ready for workloads. Um, so that's kind of, you know, a, a general upgrade path that, that applies to Telus and applies to Kubernetes. I think it could also apply to your applications and it might actually be quite a bit simpler for your apps. Um, if you look at the history of, of immutable infrastructure, you know, the, the styles and technologies and, you know, sort of fashion changes throughout the years. And, and I like to think of, of each of these iterations and evolutions in the way that people manage systems. I like to, I like to look at it as, as incremental progress. Um, we're, we're all trying to make computing a little bit safer and a little bit faster and a little bit stronger, uh, more resilient to problems. Um, more resilient to attackers and, and improve the security and and so I feel like you know every every little uh, every little thing that you do to get a little bit closer to a better system is worthwhile so i'm I'm hoping that by 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 using the the concepts of immutable infrastructure and immutable systems for your uh, for your container hosts for your kubernetes hosts I'm hoping that we can just make computing a, a little bit safer, a little bit faster, and a little bit more secure. Um, so uh, I'd be happy to, to run over to the to Q&A now. Um, if you'd like to learn more about either Talos or, or what we're doing as it relates to Kubernetes, um, maybe start with the, with the last link on this, on this slide. Our documentation page will walk you through it. Uh, you can see the source code on, on GitHub. And we would love to have you join our Slack if you'd like to have a more in-depth discussion. Uh, we've got, you know, the, the creators of the system and, and our engineers there, and we'd be happy to uh, happy to talk. Um, the The project is is has been around for about you know two and a half years, as I said. Uh, we we would love to have um, more contributors, more users poking at the system and uh, and finding ways to to improve it. So, hope to see you there. Um, I will stop here and I will switch over to Q&A if I can get this panel to show up and it looks like it's not actually gonna show up. So Taylor, I wonder if you wouldn't mind reading me off a question or two and, and if, I can, if I can answer it, I will. If not, I will, <laughs> I'll take a pass. Of course. Okay, so the first question is from Samuel. It's, is there already a plan to have Talos OS working out of the box would be awesome with other CNCF projects like QRouter or Brook? Sure. Good question. Yeah. So I don't know the specific de the, I don't know the specific technical details of of uh, of uh, how to connect those those other CNCF projects to Talos. But what I can tell you is that our architectural approach is is such that you know we don't want to reinvent the wheel if we can avoid it. So if there's a, a good storage platform if, or if there's you know good networking platforms out there, we will work uh, and, and and integrate with those. Um, we do have uh, we do have plans to put together a, a simple um, a simple plug-in mechanism where you you'll be able to to kind of you know have these things out of the box if if you so choose. Um, but today. Uh, Today, basically, you can run most of that stuff just as a container alongside the rest of your infrastructure uh, managed by Kubernetes, managed by Talos. Okay, next question. How is Talos OS Linux different with Core OS? Sure, good question. I think you'll see a lot of similarities. You know, we were, we were heavily inspired by Core OS. We thought that Core OS was moving in the right direction. Um, I think what you'll see in terms of differences is, you know, we've gone, we've gone further uh, sort of in a more radical direction than CoreOS did. So, you know, we're not based on any other Linux, Linux distribution out there. Um, we're much, we're, we're quite a bit more minimal than CoreOS. Uh, we've removed SSH, we've removed console access. Uh, I, I believe that CoreOS was a little bit more of a general purpose operating system. It was, it was suitable for application, ho you know, application hosting as well. Um, we are, you know, today we're very strictly focused on the host, on the host environment. And so everything that we do in the system is going to be oriented around making, uh, making your Kubernetes host deployment easier and, and safer and faster. Okay, the next question is from David. Is Talos HA, can you run more than one control plane? 
Uh, let's see. I believe the answer is yes, but if you want a, defini a definitive answer from um, our engineers, uh, they, let's see, I've, I've got a live update right from Andrew here. Yes, um, you can, I think you can run as many, oh, hey, I see the questions and answers now. Excellent. Oh, good. Uh, yes, you can, you can run those uh, in, an, in an HA environment. And, and I believe, we, you know, we've kind of, we, we've done our very best not to impose any additional architectural restrictions on your um, on your Talos based environment. So uh, each each Kubernetes master is, is a Talos master and you can have uh, multiple ones. All right, next question. Can you mix Talos hosts and non Talos non Talos hosts in the Kubernetes cluster? Oh boy, let's see. I'm probably going to have to wait. Yep. Okay, I'm getting yeses from the engineering team. Uh, yes, I, I. My understanding is that as long as the uh, as long as those two, as long as your control plane and the and the non Talos hosts are compatible version wise, etc., and you've got the right bootstrap tokens and so on, um, yes, you can. Whether you'd want to in a you know long term, I'm not sure, but yes. Okay, the questions just keep coming in. Um, next one from Dimitri. Uh, first impressions of AWS Bottle Rocket OS. Yeah, um, good question. Yeah, so we 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 had a, we heard a rumor that Amazon was building something similar to Talos, and sure enough, they are. There there are definitely some technical similarities. Uh, I think that I think that Bottle Rocket was was somewhat inspired. The design of Bottle Rocket was somewhat inspired by the design of Talos. Um, and you know we we think it's you know we think it's great val great validation for us we're 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 glad that uh, that Amazon is building something similar to Talos because it it kind of you know it justifies our existence and it justifies the work that we're doing. Um, we like a lot of the technical aspects of the system. Uh, I think that you know. I think that technologically, you know, we're, we're a little bit further along in terms of uh, our development. And I know that Amazon is kind of, you know, they're naturally, they're focused on the Amazon componentry. We are, we are very strictly cloud agnostic and we have support for as many, um, as many cloud platforms and as many uh, other, other sorts of deployment infrastructure as, as we can. Um, but yeah, we're looking forward to uh, to seeing what the what the Amazon folks are doing, and if there if there are good ideas there, hopefully we can share. Okay, next question: What is the release cycle of Talos? How far is it behind Kubernetes upstream? Yeah, great. So we've been we've made a commitment um, to you know kind of track upstream Kubernetes as closely as possible. So you know, as opposed to some of the other more complicated platforms like OpenShift, we are able to, uh, we're able to be more responsive to the Kubernetes releases. Um, previously, we had, we had, our, our release cycle was kind of, uh, you know, kind of mirrored, it mirrored the Kubernetes release cycle. So every three months we'd release something, it would have the latest version of, of Kubernetes there. Um, we're in process of kind of changing that deployment model and moving to kind of a, a faster cycle, but I think we're, we'll still maintain that commitment to shipping within reason, the latest version of Kubernetes that, that we can just, you know, it's a, it's a fast moving project and, you know, our approach might change in two years when things are more, uh, things are, are more mature and, and, and further along. Uh, but for the time being, we're going to, we're making a commitment to, to be as quick as we can to release after a Kubernetes release. Okay. Um, from Next question is when you coordinate a node, the Kubernetes service might still route the traffic to that node and thus you, the client, can experience some percentage of errors. How to avoid that? Let's see. That would be a great question to ask our Slack channel. I see that Andrew is typing a bit of a response, so I'll see if we can get something quick. But if you'd like a if you'd like a longer response, um, please drop into the into the Slack and and ask us. Uh, I the the architecture there is is a little bit uh, a little bit above my above my my pay grade, so to speak. So. I'm I'm sure there's a good answer, but I'll I'll wait for I'll wait for the team to chime in. Um, I, I think it's probably not going to be specific to Talos, though. So any solution that you can find in kind of the the broader Kubernetes ecosystem, you you could apply to a, a Talos-based system. Should we move on for a second? Come back to that one. Or are you? Oh, I think. Yeah, I think that's the best I can do. Live. Okay, let's do let's do that. Thomas, <laughs> if, if you need a if you need further answers, uh, feel free to drop in and 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 ping us on Slack. Okay, so the next one is um, clarifying that you have nothing to do with Oracle Talos, single point of talent. 
<laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, the namespace is crowded. Um, we have not received uh, any cease and desists from from Oracle or Cisco or any of these other folks, um, and we're hoping to keep it that way. But there are only so many names out there, um, so that's where we're at. But no relation. All right. How mature is Talos to run production services, in particular on bare metal? Sure. Yeah. So Talos is as the operating system itself. You know, we've been around for you know two and a half, three years. We have an uh, we have a handful of folks who have who have talked. You know, community members who have. Uh, who have been working with us for a while and they are running in production. Um, it's a, you know, the, the operating system itself is, is fairly simple. There aren't that many moving parts and pieces. Uh, the, the code is, is all pretty, uh, pretty straightforward, relatively speaking. So we feel as though Talos is, um, is ready for production. Uh, in terms of bare metal, um, I would say stay tuned. We're actually going to release something related to Talos and bare metal very soon um, that I think will will be interesting. So so stick around and um, watch for that release, and and hopefully it'll be useful for you. Okay, is Talos available through any public cloud providers? Yeah, definitely. So uh, the cloud providers were really kind of our first target. Um, so we have support and, and some documentation for Amazon, for Azure, for uh, for Google's cloud platform. Um, so yeah, all of uh, all of the major cloud platforms are provided, and and we publish assets for for every provider on every Talos release. Uh, so yes. Okay. Uh, any plans to maintain a Terraform provider for Talos? Yes, we would love that. Uh, it's been on our roadmap. Um, it's one of the things, you know, one of the one of the things that we know that we need to do is build integrations with existing system management tools, right? So maybe an Ansible module, maybe a Terraform provider. Um, we we have not ourselves had the uh, had the resources to work on that, but you know, in in terms of you know community contribution, if if someone were to come to us and say they wanted to to work on that, we would be happy to help, and we could provide some some guidance and some assistance, and I think that would be really valuable. So, uh, Lucas, yes, if you're interested in 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 this in more detail, if you want to, you know, give us some opinions, if you want to maybe maybe sketch something out, we'd be happy to hear from you. Okay, next from David, can you run Windows containers workloads on Talos? Good question. I am not sure. I don't think I don't think we've tested that. Uh, I, I think, you know, if if you can run, if you can, if you could run these workloads in an, in an ordinary vanilla Kubernetes environment, you almost certainly could run them on uh, on Talos, you know, whatever Kubernetes and container D supports will support. Uh, but we have not, you know, it's not part of our test matrix and um, it's not something we're targeting now, but if there's, you know, if there's community or, or customer interest, we'll, uh, we'll make it happen. Okay. Um, this one's from Sai, um, from resiliency perspective. Um, Talos provides, Bo does Talos provide Bosch? How is it defined at Cloud Foundry? Yeah, if I understand the question correctly, um, I think that, that Bosch is a is a deployment methodology for uh, for Kubernetes, if I remember right. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Sai, if, if I understand your question fully. But if, if you'd like us to to dig in, you know, please feel free to send us an email or, or join our Slack, and we'd be happy to talk. I, I I haven't done a head to head comparison or or anything like that, but we'd be happy to to take a look. Great, thanks, Sai. Um, and then, what are typical approaches to investigating and responding to a security comp compromise without a shell access? Yeah, great question. So a couple different things there. Um, this is something that we've talked a lot about internally. You know, how do we how do we take advantage of uh, of kind of our unique architecture in that we don't have SSH, don't have console access. Um, there's there's a few different angles there. So so basically, when you're troubleshooting a Talos-based environment, whether it's responding to a security compromise or um, you know dealing with some other problem in in the system, uh, our API has been designed to replace the, uh, the the process of logging in and checking log files and, and and you know running process lists and so on. So the the OSCTL command line tool, which talks to the API. Um, 
handles all that for you. So you can fetch log files, you can look at process lists, you can, you can, you know, list files, you can dump, dump files from the file system. You can do all that analysis work in, in a slightly different way. Uh, you can also stand up a, an administrative container alongside, right? So, um, I think that the Kubernetes world kind of calls these sidecars. So you might stand up an SSH sidecar to really get in there and, and take a look at things. Uh, we think that our architecture gives us uh, some interesting opportunities to build tools for this sort of thing. So perhaps, you know, if we detect a security compromise or if the administrators see something fishy, um, in the future, we hope we, we plan on building some tooling around that. So, that, so you'll be able to say, oops, stop this container, pause it, freeze it, move it to Amazon S3 or download the, the container image to your workstation, um, immediately take it out of rotation if you think it's compromised, and then you have this disk image that you can then analyze um, uh, you know, out of production, out of, uh, out, of, out of band. So yeah, I think you know, we've talked a lot about this and we think that, that there's some really interesting capabilities that we, would be possible in this kind of architecture. So stay tuned and if you're interested in that sort of thing, um, we'd love your input. Uh, we do a couple things out of the box. We, we, we've begun working with the Linux IMA, uh, Integrity Measurement Architecture, which actually uh, at a kernel level watches for changes to files and, and, can, and can, you know, send some signal somewhere in, in case there's a, a suspicious activity. Um, so we hope to expand the use of that and, um, and build out some tooling for, for that exact purpose, for that kind of, you know, forensics uh, approach. Okay, next question from Lucas. Um, I've had issues with minimal container-based OSs like Container Linux and Rancher OS not supporting some low-level components slash drivers for things like NFS mounts. Are you aware of any similar limitations in Telos? Yeah, great question. Um, I am sure that there are similar uh, limitations in Talos, you know, here and there. We um, we build our own kernel uh, kind of out of the box. You know, we don't enable, we, we, we we kind of, you know, we've we've chosen to uh, minimize the number of kernel modules that we that we build in entirely. Uh, we do have some tooling so you can build your own kernel with your own configuration if you need to to enable certain drivers or certain kernel features. Um, we do have users who are using NFS, and and I think that that particular limitation is does pro probably doesn't apply, apply to Talos. Uh, but you know, you might run into things, especially in a bare metal environment, you might, might run into a situation where you're missing a particular kernel driver. And we do have a path to build your own custom kernel and, uh, and include those, include that driver support. Okay, well, we don't have any other open questions at the moment. Um, maybe we can give it a minute, see if anything else comes in before we um, close up. Sure. So if you have any questions, anybody, please enter them in the Q&A right now. Yeah, and if you think of something uh, after the fact, feel free to you know shoot me an email, uh, tim at talos-systems.com. Uh, we'd be happy to have you join our Slack. Um, we do we do host a, a weekly community meeting um, that you can join, kind of you know office hours with the team. Be happy to uh, happy to have a live discussion either you know on the on the video call or just on Slack whenever we're we're always there, always 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 eager to talk to new users and, and people who are interested. Okay, here's another question from Axel. How about these drivers? What about GPU support on bare metal? Um, that might be challenging, right? Yeah, yeah. So we've had a we've had a few people uh, ask about this. Uh, we've done a little bit of investigatory work to see what it would take. Um, I think you know, in general, uh, the the previous answer to the the you know the kernel driver question applies. Um, if you can if you can build your own kernel with the with the the options that you need enabled um, and and set up the pass throughs and so on. Uh, within the the Kubernetes and the Container D infrastructure, then then you're good to go. Um, it's not something that's in our test matrix today, but I think it you know I think it will it, it will be there at some point. Okay. Well, we don't have any new questions. All right, Tim. Um, I think that about wraps things up, unless anything comes in in the next 20 seconds. 
Um, but thank you for a great presentation. There was such good engagement and questions from the from the crowd. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, We'd just like to thank everybody uh, for joining us today and let you know that the, the webinar recording and the slides will be available later today at cncf.io slash webinars. So keep an eye out for that. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all at um, a future CNCF webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks, everyone. Hope to see you around.